swing at about 80%. Um, you might hear it from my voice. So uh, I ask for your indulgence if, I, if I'm a spy now. Um, there'll be a boring section to my uh, presentation, which involves me reading uh, about seven pages. And hopefully it's, um, that um, sort of projection over there shows there'll be some slides with some statistical data, which I managed to collect uh, over the last uh, couple of months, I think, uh, in relation to this paper. So hopefully that would be, uh, uh, that'll be the more interesting bit. I always find it hard to actually find people who just read and it is, I'm used to visual cues, but again, bear with me. Now, just to um, get along with things, um, the sort of the kernel, as Father Chipran was saying um, very early on, uh, the kernel of the idea for this paper emerged um, rather unexpectedly from a meeting that we had I think in Cambridge about two years ago. Um, Father Chipran was visiting Cambridge um, for research and we met to learn more about each other's work. Um, Father Chipran was also interested in uh, the work of the Institute in Cambridge and the ecumenical context, and I was delighted to learn about his research and experience of the African Orthodox Church. Um, now, I must emphasize that th this is very much an exploratory paper. Um, I'm not aware of um, an existing body of comparative research into Orthodox communities belonging to the same um, autocephalous church in relation to secularization. Um, so their diaspora and home country. Um, there is ongoing research about the um, evolution of religious life, observance and affiliation in Eastern Europe, Greece and Russia. Um, some of you um, are in this room. Um, um, I'll just mention uh, David Martin's, for example, The Future of Christianity, Reflection on Violence and Democracy, Religion and Secularization, a, a 2011 book, very useful. Um, Kara Giannis' um, Secularism in, in Context, uh, looking at, at the Greek state and the Church of Greece. Uh, Daphne Hali, um, Hali Kipolu, um, 2010, Patterns of Secularization, um, Church, State and Nation in Greece um, and Ireland. And uh, the Romanian Sorin Gork, who wrote a, a very good um, a book on atheism, national choice theory of religion and the issue of emerging secularization in post communist Romania. But given um, all this work, <coughs> somewhat surprisingly, very little attention or material has been written about, as it were, the new European Orthodox diaspora, if I could call it like that, which has been forming and growing slowly but surely since the mid late 1990s. Uh, I know that Father Ciprian's. Um, 2018 book, um, looking at Russian Orthodox diaspora as a global religion after 1918, um, is something new and uh, it might actually open a new avenues of, of research and thought um, in this area. But other than that, I think the field is quite um, scarce. Um, Orthodox diaspora usually um, triggers investigation and debate over jurisdiction, church canons, and ecumenical dialogue at an institutional level, while the impact of secularization on these communities in the diaspora or the reverse is insufficiently considered, um, certainly insufficiently considered with a degree of theological investment. It's usually sociologists of religion that pay attention to this dynamic, sometimes rubbing their hands that their theories <coughs> are proven correct. Romanians are an important contributor to this new Orthodox diaspora with anything between three to five million Romanian migrants in Western Europe estimated in 2018. It varies from the way you look um, yet there seems to be very little interdisciplinary research with respect to cross-country religious identity and practice. The basic assumption is, unfortunately, in Orthodox Church circles, uh, that Romanians will continue by default to carry their indigenous religious identity as they migrate, and linked to that, that not doing so represents a betrayal of one's national heritage and religious identity, uh, giving up to secularization, is it? There are several things wrong, I think, with these two assumptions. Um, but the most obvious, um, to, to my mind, are the fact that um, we have this taken for grantedness aspect of it, which kind of harken back, harkens back to a, an ethnophilatistic theological inclination. And the second one is that the onus to maintain one's religious identity, or even more so to cultivate it, uh, seems to be placed first on um, with the migrant individual and the um, stance seems to be that the church as an institution is there to work with this material, with this human and faith material, rather than look out for it and unearth it. Even more so, the attitude is that this material 
is to be, uh, even in the diaspora context, um, as, uh, as Klaus was mentioning, um, is to be kind of molded in a form that resembles as much as possible the home country identity. I believe that this in itself is a symptom of ecclesial secularization. It's a lack of presentness and creative attention to the meaning and mission of the church. Now, um, that is why, I, I, as I said, uh, the ethos of the short paper is to tentatively investigate um, and ask some fundamental theological questions about identity and space in the context of secularization, and doing this uh, in an interdisciplinary way as much as I can in the span of these kind of 20 something minutes. Uh, taking some cues from the sociology of religion and uh, socio social anthro anthropology. So I will structure my presentation in three parts. Um, uh, first, that it's important to frame what I'm trying to say here within the secularization paradigm, otherwise many of you might um, not have, um, uh, might not be familiar with this and might not, might struggle to grasp what I'm saying. Secondly, I will introduce to you uh, the short survey that um, I mentioned, which was conducted in six parishes, three in Romania and three in Yash, uh, the only Yash here. Um, uh, three in the UK uh, during the months of November, December last year. Uh, the aim of the survey was to collect, even in, if limited in range, um, I have no claims that it's a kind of a, a, a proper kind of a representative uh, uh, survey, but um, uh, the aim was it to collect, even if limited, some parish data to help ground my thinking and some of the claims I'm trying to make here. And thirdly, I will attempt to draw a, f uh, uh, draw a few conclusions based on the survey results. Hopefully, it's something that we can continue in the conversation. Um, <coughs> issues about, that, about identity and space rest at the core of, uh, of this and run throughout the paper because I believe the continual formation of identity, which is performed through a narrative uh, or a specific type of narrative, and the negotiation of space, or better said, the, of the geography of the sacred in a secular context, are crucial meeting points for Romanian Orthodox communities in the diaspora and Romania. And I mean, I'm using this as a, as a lens. Uh, I suppose a lot of this might um, apply to Russians or Greeks, but there, certainly there are differences um, there. Now, about the secularization process. Um, secularization, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, represents this social, cultural, theological process triggered by conditions of modernity that is challenging for religious life and practice that is certainly kind of the classical approach to this. Um, the paradigm rests on the postulate that modernity brings changes in social structure and culture that make religion more or less plausible or more or less desirable. This is uh, <coughs> Steve Bruce, um, the British sociologist of religion, lives and dies by this. Um, I tend to agree with him. <laughs> the process, um, other people like Ryan Wilson, um, as early as 1966, Define it as the process whereby religious thinking, practices, and institutions lose their social significance. Charles Taylor famously, in his uh, Secular Age, um, defined it as the presumption of unbelief that has become dominant. And um, again, Steve Bruce tries to frame it again as the displacement of religion from the center of human life. So different kind of nuances to this process. Um, at the level of communities and, and, and individuals, the result of the secularization process is usually associated with declining church attendance. But again, as Steve Bruce points out, this is always um, there's always more than that. He uh, points to a decline in, uh, in the extent to which people engage in religious practices, display beliefs of a religious <coughs> kind, and conduct other aspects of their lives in a way informed by such beliefs. Um, now, when this happens, I think this is very much related to the development of a to the existence and development of a pluralistic societal environment. Religious identity is more difficult to negotiate or to maintain in a pluralistic context. The, it, this is not a, uh, nothing, there's nothing new here, especially in a secular one. But the and, and the negotiation of religious identity and space. Um, which we tend to associate more with the West, I actually think it's happening actively um, in Romania as well. But unlike, let's say, in, for example, in the UK, um, for example, in Romania, I think this negotiation is inevitably uh, cushioned or decounted by factors such as ethno-religiosity, cultural and historic religious appropriation, or by genera generational um, dynamics. Uh, this <coughs> ecosystem of Romanianness is arguably non-existent in the West, um, the UK, for example, or if it is present, it's only present by proxy in relation uh, to some parish communities uh, or to uh, communities of professionals, uh, people congregate 
uh, in a religiously neutral way, uh, simply because they're from the same country. Now, um, I'm very much aligned to Steve Bruce's um, approach to secularization, who continues to argue that this is really um, occurring, um, uh, that religion is losing or is diminishing its role in society. Um, and I appreciate the kind of this dis dispersion or um, the religious change perspective advocated by Grace Davy, for example, and others like her, but I don't think it is uh, helpful for theologians. Um, the religious change approach is extremely helpful because it asks a series of nuanced questions about religious change, and it aims to contextualize the process of secularization, but it also, I think, runs the risk of moving the goalposts mid-game, and for theologians, this is very, um, a very dangerous slope. Now, um, David Martin makes a compelling argument uh, um, in, um, about the specific conditions and trajectory of the secularization project, um, the process, um, as well as his, um, he has a fantastic insight into what he calls portable identities and landlocked identities. And uh, I found uh, these things to be very helpful as I was framing my uh, reasoning in relation to this paper. Um, David Martin also makes a strong claim for Eastern Orthodoxy, specifically Romanian Orthodoxy, as an ethno-religion, which over the centuries, both under the Ottoman and the Communist periods, represented, and I quote from, it, uh, quote from him, the D1 vehicle to continuing Romanian identity. Um, and the Orthodox Church, particularly in its institutional structure, um, being perceived as the embodiment and carrier of that identity, which is the opposite of what tends to be the case in the West, where, as David Martin um, says, the church is con uh, conceived as a distinct institutional entity teaching specific doctrines. Uh, incidentally, Stephen Runciman made a similar point all the way back to in 1971 in his the Orthodox Churches and the Secular State. Um, another relevant perspective in terms of secularization for this investigation is that of the French sociologist um, religion, Daniel um, Hebrel-Leger, which refers to religion as a chain of memory. And she associates the growth of secularization with the dislocation of the structures of religion's plausibility in the modern world, which works in parallel with the advance of rationalization and successive stages in the crumbling of collective memory. And she argues rightly that we live in a world where the vast incoherent mass of available information is decreasingly amenable to being ordered in a more or less impromptu way that collective memory was able to achieve by finding explanatory links. Uh, because of the plural and secular Western context, okay, the crumbling of collective memory is a real risk for diaspora communities, um, especially when that memory is of a religious nature, and even more so when it, is when it was culturally, linguistically, or historically circums circumscribed for many uh, generations. I have, a, as a priest in the UK, um, every week a first-hand experience of that occurring, um, both with adults and especially with children. Um, this is a case um, for Romanian Orthodox diaspora communities that the collective memory is not only, uh, I think in a way, crumbling or risks of crumbling, but it is replaced by a, 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 a new one, uh, a lot of it kind of secular in, con in content. Um, but at the same time, there is this huge opportunity that this kind of maybe old crumbling collective memory um, could be replaced by a new one, uh, a new identity, a new religious identity. Um, and the Orthodox Church is fundamentally a church of the preservation of memory in some way. Um, do this in remembrance of me. But as both the distance and the more recent past have shown, uh, for example, what's happening in Ukraine, not all memories are the same. Or better said, not all share the same memories <coughs> of the time. Memories continually redefine socially, historically, and culturally, particularly when it comes to nationally and historically framed religious identity. In the Romanian uh, context, both in Romania and abroad, uh, as far as faith communities are concerned, it is important to ask what kind of memory are we constructing, which is to say, what kind of identity are we forming? Is the church the carrier of Christological identity, first and foremost? Or has the Christic and Eucharistic identity become merely a shell, a substitute carrier of a very historically specific, specifically framed um, narrative? Now, I, there's not enough space to unpack in this paper the secularization process in Romania, 
but it's essential to say that the process cannot be separated from at least three things. <coughs> First, the ethno-religious elements of Romanian orthodoxy. Secondly, the construction and the management of religious memory, as well as from the inescapable institutional manifestation of the church. In many ways, these three elements contribute, I believe, to the process of secularization in Romania, because they create a framework of engagement with modern Romanian society, which reaffirms, firstly, this reaffirms institutional structures and differentiation. Um, secondly, um, a type of religious memory which struggles, in my opinion, to reach the right balance between the preservation of the essential past and a fresh affirmation of the newness of the old, as it were, for contemporary generations, as well as perpetuating a sort of a late 19th, early 20th century uh, interwar e and ethno-dependent <coughs> ecclesiology. These three elements are not present um, in the secularized context of the West um, and of the UK, for example. <coughs> and if they are present, they are present by adoption, as it were. Um, it's also important to state that in Western Europe, uh, or in the UK, particularly Romanian Orthodox people are entering, are entering a mature secularized context. Um, also, this secularized context of the West is the result of a different type of secularization, uh, which, um, as many people argue, um, has the Protestant Reformation as, as its cornerstone. Um, the results might be the same, but the blueprint and the premises are not. On the other hand, in Romania, Romanian Orthodox individuals and communities, I believe, are growing inevitably into a process of secularization. Um, In Romania, secularization is heralded um, um, in a very Romanian way um, by pluralism and fast and, and kind of rapid social change. Um, Romania is still very a very conservative, traditional, rural country in many parts. In ways, uh, in many ways, it's a country of two um, halves. Um, and in a way, the response of the church to this. Um, on the one hand, has been an institutionally framed response in order to protect itself from the effects of pluralism and so social cultural change. And on the other, it is manifested as a, I believe, hermeneutical deficiency or inadequacy to mitigate the pace and nature of this change. The in 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 uh, inadequacy rests, I believe, in an over-reliance on tradition and heritage, as well as the ethnic national identity which is not matched by a forward-looking, biblical, Christological, <coughs> and pneumatological fresh approach to contemporary issues. This fresh perspective would require the abandonment of a more than a century-old paradigm predicated on the, if I could co uh, coin it like this, perichoresis of religious and ethnic identity. The reason why I uh, feel that uh, this ought to be the case is because my own experience of diaspora as a Christian, as a religious individual, has starkly shown how inadequate and limiting is this paradigm outside of the borders of one's native country. Abroad, the limits of the old existing paradigm are uncompromisingly laid bare, certainly for anyone who takes seriously their religious or faith identity. Paradoxically, freeing oneself from the binary limitation of national identity and religious identity does not damage either. On the contrary, it frees one to be more in touch with one's faith and with one's social and cultural heritage. One can be a better Romanian and a better Orthodox if we unmuddled this connection. Let me be clear, I'm not advocating for a severance, but for less of an automatic um, <coughs> communication of properties, as it were. St. Paul says, there is neither Jew or Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. Also says in First Colossians, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Um, briefly, um, turning to uh, issues of identity and space um, in Romania and the UK. In the Romanian context, the accent rests on the priority to maintain and perpetuate uh, traditional values, some may call it conservative identity and space. When I say space, I mean societal space, but also liturgical space. Uh, I will return to that um, in, in a minute. In the UK, it has been my experience that there is more of a tension, more of a negotiation between the maintaining and the reappropriating or the shaping of that religious and social cultural identity. When I say tension, I charge it with a positive outlook. Most, if not all, of the people that I've met as a priest um, in the UK who returned very quickly to Romania or moved back to, uh, to Italy or Spain because they moved to the UK from there, for example, um, 
were people who um, were aiming at copy pasting the cultural the religious identity in a migration setting rather than transitioning it to the new context. This is, what exa this is exactly what David Martin was referring to portable versus landlocked identities. It's a tragedy to be a mobile person with a landlocked identity as much it is to be a landlocked person with a mobile identity. In relation to the diaspora context, it, it is important to, men, uh, to mention that Romanian migration in the UK represents a kind of a second wave, as in the mid-90s um, until roughly the 2005, most Romanians chose to migrate to Italy, Spain, Portugal, and France. Even more interestingly, the second wave in the UK included, uh, as I said, Romanians who previously had uh, lived in Spain and Italy, looking for better or more secure job prospects in the UK. Many of them were expecting to find parishes and communities that were similar to the ones they attended in Spain or Italy, for example. And to the surprise of many, the Anglo-Saxon context, which also informs the setup of Romanian Orthodox parishes to some extent, was not identical to what they had experienced prior. It has to be said that most Romanian economic migration to Spain and Italy, for example, unlike that in the UK, has been from rural, more traditionally oriented parts of Romania that has shaped the orientation of those communities. I'll just briefly mention church services uh, in terms of space. Without going into much into details, I will say that the focus in the UK, it seems to me, to be on the divine liturgy, on serving the liturgy, on receiving Holy Communion, which is a good thing. It varies from parish to parish, but there is a common thread, I think. Um, we're trying to be contextual and not um, kind of you know, do monastic services um, in, in diaspora communities. Um, the most obvious contrast between the UK and the Romanian context for Orthodox believers um, is one that um, in the UK, I think, one is exposed or, or experiences the condition of a minority. More precisely, from a secularization perspective, this experience of minority is twice so. One is a minority, Orthodox, within a minority, religious people or observant Christians. Romanian Orthodox in Romania almost never experience the condition of a faith minority, quite the opposite. Uh, perhaps in some parts in Transylvania. Um, secularization is inc incompatible with the spirit of the condition of a minority, because being in a minority tends to focus its priorities, strength, and community bonds, encourages one to ask what is essential, what is absolutely necessary for identity, what is my faith, what do I believe? And it has been my experience that people who come to church in the UK are an empowered minority. I've met people, Romanians, who do not come to church when, when you only talk to them, you feel like they are, are a powerless minority. They lack their, that um, core. Um, two minutes, great. Um, now, issues of space. Um, I cannot um, finish without saying something about distance. Distance is a factor that has, been take, has to be taken into account. The management of distance for faith communities in the UK, at least, is part and parcel of one's religious identity. People choose to come to church. It takes planning, more planning, and commitment than one usually assigns to this endeavor in the Romanian context. As uh, again, Steve Bruce was saying, talk is cheap. Attendance has the value of the, um, that it uh, requires some effort and shows some degree of commitment. I would venture to say that in Romania, probably the reverse <coughs> is applicable. People have to deal with the management of proximity which is another way of saying that they have to manage the risk and often the reality of uh, being supersaturated or overexposed. There are statistics about the number of new churches erected post-1990. This is not a critic um, that there should be uh, churches built in Romania. It's just a, a, a statement. Um, it, but, but it is a fact of life that um, you have to manage this priority, this uh, proximity. Um, now, um, I think maybe I'll leave the slides. I, I ran over. Um, but uh, if I could, can I get two minutes for the slide test? Um, this survey that I, I did, um, it had about 212 uh, participants. Um, there were 110 in, the, in, in Romania, 112 in the US. Um, male and female, it seems that women, uh, again, have slightly edged um, in, in responding. Um, uh, the age group is interesting um, because um, if you can see, um, um, sorry, um, 
the blue line in the UK, that's between 30 and 40 years old, uh, people between 30 and 40 years old. In the, in the Romanian context, it's much more evenly spread, but there's quite a, uh, a big chunk of over 60s down there at the bottom. Uh, I've asked <coughs> how often do they go to church? Um, um, in the UK, people tend to go, about 42% go every um, week. Um, almost 70%, 69% go every week in, um, in Romania to church. Um, but that is consistent with um, when you ask them, how do they get to church? Um, in Romania, most people travel and <laughs> walk to church. So it's easy. Proximity um, is not a problem. Um, um, distance is not a problem. Whereas in the UK, um, the yellow and um, these two lines, people travel by car um, between 15 and 30 minutes, or sometimes between 30 minutes, more than 30 minutes to get to church. So it, it, it shows commitment. Um, unsurprisingly, somehow, in both cases, people say that going to church helps maintain their national and language identity. It's very important to them. Um, uh, it's 74% uh, in the UK and 80% uh, in the Romanian um, um, sample. Um, when asked how long, how often do they pray at home, um, again, uh, it seems that the Romanian um, contingent um, gives about 65% uh, praying uh, at least twice a day. Um, it's more evenly distributed um, in the UK. Um, I asked them why do they go to church, and they were they were um, asked to attach a value from one to five for each answer is appropriate from not important to very important. Um, and again, it's interesting to think that um, most of them, in both cases, go to church to pray, that's the blue line, but also to cope with difficulties. <coughs> and um, the penultimate line there, it's because they feel good going to church. It's, I think that's also important to feel like they belong. It's, it's a place where they can um, find some comfort. Um, and when they do not go to church, um, in, in the case of UK communities, uh, many say, 51% uh, almost say that it's because of their jobs, because of their work pattern. Um, um, and um, in the, uh, in the Romanian case, uh, the, uh, the line uh, here uh, is uh, really another reason, and many say health, or some, so it, they, they wouldn't necessarily give a, a specific reason. Now, the last one was a bit of a, was a bit of a <laughs> yeah, that's a, a correct reaction. I asked, I wanted to, to see how many people actually know the creed. Um, it's interesting to think that in the UK, most people, 60% um, almost, gave the right answer um, by far. Whereas in, Rom in the Romanian sample, um, not really. So people go to church. Uh, more, more, more often, they pray more often, uh, they're closer to church, and uh, they're not really uh, familiar with the uh, fundamentals of the faith. Um, it's interesting to think about that. Anyway, maybe we'll pick it up more in the conversation. Sorry to run over. Thank you.